Hello. This video is actually kind of follow-up to one of my previous misadventures and travel videos. It's the video um, when we missed the train in Denver and I'll put a link to it in the description below so you can go back and um, watch that one. Uh, I mentioned in that video that there was a second part of that story of that same trip that was worse than the one I described in there and I'm going to talk to you about that one today. This again is another very serious one. There isn't really anything funny about this, um, but I wanted to share it with you because it's a pretty big story, something major that happened. Okay, so after we caught our train again in Denver, or in west of the Rockies, after we missed it in Denver, um, my dad and I were continuing on our train trip, which was a big train trip, and going back to that, I think it was actually Glenwood Springs where we picked up the train again. Not Grand Junction, but I'm not completely sure. I just remember that it started with a G, so it could be either one. We continued westward on Amtrak um, and went to Sacramento. My grandparents lived in Sacramento at the time, so we spent, I don't know how many days, visiting with them. And then um, we took the train again. We took Amtrak again to San Francisco. And I remember we stayed in a nice hotel right on Union Square, and... I was excited to do sightseeing and stuff. We'd been to San Francisco before, but on this particular one, um, it was just my dad and me. That t the time we'd been there before, I think my brother had been with us and then one of his friends. And so, um, and it was like I said, it was Christmas time. My Christmas break, my college that I went to was on trimesters, and so we actually um, got off fairly early in December. So we had like two, three weeks to work with before Christmas. Um, that we had off school. So um, it wasn't Christmas yet. It was before Christmas, but everything in the city was decorated for Christmas. And I remember it was really pretty. And my dad has always been a very active, healthy guy. He, um, he again, I think he was 48 at the time. So, um, you know, he was still very active. He, I mean, even to this day, he's 76 years old now and he still works full time. He bikes every day. He golfs, he bowls, um, he mows my lawn. <laughs> so, I mean, he's a very healthy, active guy. So it was, he was always like, go, go, go. And it was very unusual for him to not be at a faster pace even than us kids in, you know, like seeing things and traveling around. And so um, I remember when we were in San Francisco, I was like, come on, dad, let's go see this and let's go see that. And he kept having to sit down and rest. And he'd be like, just a minute, I just got to rest for a minute. And I remember kind of thinking that that was weird. And like, I was annoyed with him because I was 18 and I just wanted to see stuff. And he just kept having to like sit down and rest and he'd be like mopping his brow and stuff. And, and I was like, what's wrong with you? And I don't know if I actually asked him if something was wrong. He certainly didn't tell me anything was wrong. And so anyway, um... After however many days in San Francisco, we got back on Amtrak again and took the train to San Diego, and we were going to be seeing stuff in San Diego. I have, to this day, not gotten to see anything in San Diego, which you will find out why in a minute. Um, that is, I forgot to mention that on my other destinations bucket list. I really would like to go back to San Diego and actually see stuff this time because I didn't get to and I've never been back since. So um, there's a lot of things I'd like to see in San Diego. Um, we got to San Diego at night, like late. And I don't know if that was normal or if the train was delayed or what the deal was. But um, we checked into our hotel, which must have been right downtown somewhere or near the bay, very close to the Amtrak station. I don't remember. I, I almost feel like we walked. I don't know what, what it was. And anyway, we went to bed. When I woke up in the morning, my dad was very ill, and he was as white as snow, and he had no color in his face at all, and he was extremely weak, and he couldn't get out of bed, and he, I'm like, Dad, what's wrong? And he knew what was wrong. He had had an ulcer in the past, but had like gotten it treated. And he knew he had an ulcer and that it was very bad. And he'd known he'd had it since we were in Sacramento. 
but he didn't want to say anything because he didn't want to spoil the trip. And, you know, he figured he'd, you know, we'd have our trip and then he'd deal with it when we got home or whatever. But it apparently had gotten very, very bad. And I should mention at this time that I almost wonder if there's a genetic component to ulcers because I know that they've discovered now, you know, they used to think it was from like, like gastric reflux or whatever. And now they've say it's actually a bacteria um, because my grandmother, his mother actually died of a perforated ulcer. That was four years after this, but she actually, that's what killed her. So, um, yeah, I really do wonder if it's a genetic thing. I watch myself. <laughs> so anyway, um, certainly the stress of missing the train in Colorado had not helped. <laughs> um, so anyway, I remember I got up and I got dressed and everything and, um, I ordered him room service breakfast and he tried to eat it, but he just couldn't. He was like, just barely like trying to take like a bite or two, you know, like it was even hard for him to sit up in the bed. He got up a couple times and tried to go to the bathroom and he was so weak, like he couldn't even do that. He looked really, really bad. I've never seen my dad look like that ever. He's never looked like that since. Um, even like coming out of gallbladder surgery, he didn't look that bad. So um, he told me, we had a travel agent, and he told me to call the travel agent and have her book us a flight home right away. And, you know, because we were supposed to still be in San Diego for a few days and then take the Amtrak all the way home, which would have taken like two, three more days. So it would have still been like, I don't know, five, six, seven days until we would have gotten home. And as I mentioned in one of my other earlier videos about when we went to Florida, flying was not something that we did with my dad. Um, we did it more so later when I was older and married and had kids and stuff because I was making the travel arrangements. But at this time, when he was planning everything, we didn't really fly. And so for him to say, book us a flight was weird. And I'm like, okay. And so I was on the phone with the travel agent telling her, we have to come home right away. My dad's really sick. You need to book us a flight today. And she was like working on that. And I was on the phone with her and I was looking at my dad and I was like, I can't, no way. I, I got to do something here. And so I said, I hung up on her, I think, or I said, I'll call you back or something. And I, I hung up. And my dad wasn't in really any condition to argue. And I called down to the front desk and I said, I need a wheelchair and a taxi. And my dad's object, no, 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 I want to just go home. And I'm like, dad, I'm taking you to the hospital. And so they brought up a wheelchair. I put my dad in the wheelchair. I took him downstairs. I got in the cab. I said to the cab driver with as much trust as I could muster, will you please take us to a good hospital? And I just had to try, I mean, I'm 18 years old. I, I just had to trust that this taxi driver was a decent human being and was going to take us someplace decent. I think he did. I think the hospital he took us to was, I don't even know what hospital it was. It was up in the hills. I remember that. And, um, he took us there and we went to emergency and they were evaluating my dad and they admitted him and, you know, they said he's really sick and they admitted him. And I went back to the hotel. I still had my credit card. Remember I said in that other video, I said, I, I think I was an authorized user on my dad's credit card. So I had a credit card and I think I took whatever cash my dad had in his wallet and whatever cash I might've had. But this was near the end of our trip. So money was getting kind of low. And again, I'm an 18 year old girl by myself in a city I've never been to. And so, um, I think I went back to the hotel. They told me he was going to be in the hotel for a while. And so I went back to the hotel. I checked out and I checked into a different hotel that was walking distance to the hospital. It was like right, like, I think it was like right next door. And, um, so that way at least I could just walk and I wasn't going to have to be wake, wasting money on taxi fare to get to him. And, um, I called home. I called my mom and my parents were divorced and my mom was living in Madison, Wisconsin. And, um, which is not where we live. And, um, she concluded quite quickly that she needed to come because I was alone. And so, um, 
she made arrangements and I don't remember the timeline of this. I don't remember if it was the same day or if it was the next day or what, but she was, um, she was taking a flight from Madison to Chicago and then she had to change planes and fly from Chicago to San Diego. And this again was way before cell phones. So we're talking on the regular phone. When she got to, I was in the hotel and when she got to Chicago on her layover, which wasn't very long, she called me from a pay phone in the hotel and we were talking on the phone and she was asking like, are there any updates on your dad or what's going on? You know, and I was just telling her and, um, uh, this is, I didn't even know this was a real thing. <laughs> the doctor from the hospital did an emergency breakthrough with the operator into the call and told me, and the operator came on and said, I have an emergency breakthrough from Dr. Smith or whatever. You need to, will you please, um, you know, release your call so that I can put him through to you. And I'm like, oh my gosh, okay. Well, my mom didn't even get to like say anything because I just had to hang up. And so she got on that flight in Chicago to San Diego, which is long, not knowing what the heck, why did the doctor break into the call like that? And um, so she had to go that whole flight not knowing what happened because, you know, she had to get on her plane. And uh, when the doctor got on the line with me, he said, your father's critical and we're taking him into emergency surgery right now. There's nothing you can do. We'll call you when it's done. <laughs> so, uh, okay. So I basically just like sat in the hotel watching TV or whatever, like freaking out, like what is going on? And, um, uh, when it got time, you know, a few hours passed or whatever. And when it was time for my mom to land at the airport, I took a cab to the airport, which thankfully San Diego's, you know, the airport's like right in town. It's pretty close. I took a cab to um, San Diego airport and I picked my mom up. And of course she rushes off the plane and right away she's like, what's happening? What's happening? And I said, they took dad into surgery. I don't know anything else. You know, that's all they told me. And she's like, okay, well, let's go to the hospital. So I don't know if we stopped and dropped her luggage off. At, well, it, they were right next to each other, like I said. So we went to the hospital and I don't know if he was still in surgery at that point or not. I don't remember that. But um, they ended up having to remove about half of his stomach. Um the part that was damaged and he has a scar now from here like all the way down um it was staples and it's pretty faded now you know because it's been uh, almost 30 years <laughs> but um he still like after that he always wore like a t-shirt when we went swimming like to the pool or anything and so um uh it was pretty bad he i remember he had to have at least two, I think, full blood transfusions because he lost so much blood. And that was a concern at the time because of the AIDS crisis and California, especially, I mean, I guess maybe a little better. We were in San Francisco, not in San Francisco. Um, but, uh, you know, they were just starting to realize, I think that, you know, AIDS had, had started with homosexual men and they didn't test the blood yet and things like that. And, um, you know, it seems so strange now that we were so scared about things like that because it's, it's so foolish. But they didn't know enough about it at the time. And it was kind of a genuine worry that you could get HIV from, from a blood transfusion. So that was something that we were kind of concerned with, I remember. But, you know, we didn't want him to die either. Um, and then worse than that, he had two cardiac arrests in the hospital and they had to resuscitate him both times. So it was pretty scary. <laughs> and I mean, obviously it was better for me once my mom was there and I wasn't all by myself. But then I remember she got kind of mad at me because they told us that, um, he was going to have to be in the hospital for quite a while. And I didn't want to stay there. It was like a couple days before Christmas and I didn't want to be sitting in the hospital and she's like, don't you want to be here if your dad dies? And 18 year old me is like, no, <laughs> I don't want to be here. And so she put me on a plane and sent me home. And I went to like my boyfriend's family and like my aunts and uncles and cousins and stuff for Christmas. 
And then eventually my mom couldn't stay there anymore. She had to like work or go to school or I don't know what it was. Um, and so she had to fly back. And I think there was a, a day or two in there where my dad was alone in the hospital. And then my uncle uh, flew out to bring him home. And the doc, the one thing that really sticks with me, and he recovered, um, I actually had to take a turn. Um, I couldn't go back to school after Christmas break because when my dad came home, which it was, I, I think it was still before New Year's or maybe right after New Year's. It was still the holidays. I, I, it was before I had to go back to school. And when he came home, he couldn't do anything. He couldn't lift anything. He couldn't shovel snow, which is critical up here, you know, and he needed me. And so I didn't go back to school um, until the next fall because I had to stay and help my dad. Um, so uh, the other thing that really stuck with me is when I took my dad to the hospital, um, to the emergency room, the doctor told me, if you had put them, put him on that plane, like he wanted me to, like my dad wanted me to, he said, if you would put him on the plane, he'd be dead. He would have died on the plane. Something about the cabin pressure and stuff with his condition, he would have died on the plane. And that really stuck with me because I was like, oh my gosh, you know? And so he recovered and obviously he's fine <laughs> and he's still alive, you know, long time later. But, um, the thing, the real lesson, I guess, from that one, well, two lessons, I guess. One is um, a mistake on my dad's part is he should have said something right away. We should have probably taken him to the hospital much sooner. I mean, ideally, when he first knew something was wrong in Sacramento and we were with my grandparents, because then if he'd ended up in the hospital... I would have stayed with my grandparents and I would have been fine. Um, that was actually my mom's parents that lived in, Sa in Sacramento. And so, um, and they had a house and everything and they would have taken care of me. So that was a mistake on his part thinking, oh, I can make it to the end of the trip and deal with it when I get home. You really shouldn't ignore symptoms of that something's wrong. That would be one thing. And then the other thing I would say is to trust your instincts because if I had not trusted my instincts when I was on the phone with the travel agent and said, nope, I'm not taking him home on the plane. I'm taking him to the hospital. He'd be dead and I wouldn't have a dad. And so um, he might have been mad at me in that moment that I wasn't listening to him and getting him a flight home. But I did what I felt in my gut I needed to do and I saved his life. So, um, Yeah. Trust your instincts. And that goes for anything that like, especially as a, as a woman or, um, you know, when you're out places and you're alone and, you know, trust your instincts about your environment, trust your instincts about people you're with, you know, all of that stuff. Oof, if I had trusted my instincts about my future ex-husband, <laughs> uh, I should have taken my own advice on that one. But anyway, um, so that would be my lesson on that one. Um, obviously this was not an ideal um, situation and it was very unusual and um, but you know medical stuff like that does happen when you're traveling uh, we met a guy on a cruise one time that was at our table and he and his wife had taken like 65 cruises or something and he had um, we were talking about having to use the medical center on the ship which We've had to use the medical center on the ship a couple times. One time on a Disney cruise, my son got um, soot in his eye from the funnel of the ship. And the doctor, it was Disney, the doctor cleaned it out and um, even called our room like the next day to check on him, which was really nice. Didn't get charged anything. And then um, the other time was um, my husband and I got, I think this is what prompted the conversation. It was on that cruise. My husband and I got in St. Martin. We were floating on floaty mats at the beach in St. Martin and we got stung by sea lice. Sea lice is actually um, jellyfish larva. There's, it's been in the news recently because it was in a real problem in Florida right now. Um, and got these stingy little bites all over you and it hurt like a dickens, you know. 
And um, we went to the um, ship medical center that time too. And so I think we were talking about it like that night at dinner. And this man was telling us that he had had to, several times he'd had to use the ship's um, medical service. Did you know that you can get dialysis in the ship medical center? So people who are on kidney dialysis can still go on a cruise. And um, like the room attendants, I guess, are really cool and adept about dealing with like CPAP machines for people with sleep apnea. Um, if you bring your C CPAP machine on the ship, they might even have some, I'm not sure. Um, they can take care of all that for you. And, um, but this guy had actually had surgery on the ship. He'd had hemorrhoid surgery on a ship. Um, so uh, it's amazing what kind of things can come up. I think the only other time I really had anything you know, even with months in London, I don't think I had anything really medical come up besides like maybe a cold or something. Um, one time I remember going to the pharmacy because I needed in Paris something you could easily buy like at Walgreens or CVS here, but I don't know, calamine lotion or cortisone cream or something. I don't know. And I remember having a little bit of trouble like describing to the pharmacist what I needed and then they figured it out what I wanted and showed me where it was. But you need to be prepared too for the possibility of all kinds of medical stuff when you um, are traveling. And one thing I would suggest is to get the travel insurance. Um, I almost always buy the travel insurance when I book a cruise. Um, some people say, eh, you don't need it, but I've always gotten it and I've needed it not because something on the cruise happened, but because I've had to change or cancel. And if I hadn't had the insurance, I would have lost my money. So, um, I definitely got the insurance for this cruise we're taking coming up in August here because it's hurricane season. Um, so, you know, think about if something major happened, would we be able to afford to deal with it without the insurance, I guess, is the way I kind of look at it. So that's my advice, too. So thanks for joining me for today's um, Misadventures in Travel. And I think I have three or four more to do. And those are all basically funny. <laughs> so look forward to um, telling you about those. And be sure to subscribe to my channel and click on the little bell so you get a notification when I put out a new video. And I will see you guys next time. Have a good day.